Indian ingredients in the words of my guest, Dr. Rumya Pucha, have become frustratingly hip in the West. I'm talking about things like turmeric, ghee, ashwagandha, coconut oil, moringa, and whatever the next superfood is. I'm personally having trouble keeping up. This is the stuff most South Asians grew up eating without questioning. The frustration lies partially in how particular things in our diets became hip and cool and worthy of celebrity attention without our say or intervention, worthy of Gwyneth Paltrow goop attention. This brings up a lot of strong feelings for me because turmeric, by all historical records, has been around at least 4,000 years, long before Gwyneth. Marco Polo marveled at the spice and its healing properties. The globalization of turmeric, or haldi, traces back to then. But this episode is not about the history of turmeric or any other Indian ingredient that has been made cool. It is about what the South Asian frustration at the coolification of these ingredients is actually about. It is also about how and why this coolification is a form of recolonization and why this is something that deserves pushback. This is Bad Table Manners, a show that seeks to push the boundaries of food reporting and narrative in South Asia. I'm Meher Varma, your host. The title of this episode, How Indian Ingredients Became Frustratingly Hip, is borrowed from one of my guests, the anthropologist Rumya Pucha, who teaches at the University of Georgia. And she thinks that she got this phrase from one of her students. The frustration that my students were noting, on one level, some of it was the very basic level of pronunciation, which they found. And I I actually do find that irritating as well, but that's not news. I also speak with the wonderful Vidya Balachandar, the Dubai-based editor who was South Asia's editor for Whetstone magazine, the parent company of Whetstone Radio Collective. We talk not just about how Indian ingredients became cool without us really having a say in it, but how South Asian women like her and I grapple with the cliched idea that we somehow embody gastronomic and cultural authenticity 24-7. I find this idea of completely taking one thing and selling it as your own and profiting off of it, yes, I find that problematic. And that is basically cultural appropriation. Rumia is working on an amazing project called Namaste Nation that talks about stuff like how white women co-opted yoga and how certain spices like turmeric became so removed from their original context that now they may be recognized only in their Starbucks form as turmeric chai tea latte, which by now many globally hip people know, makes no sense at all because you're essentially saying turmeric tea tea latte. But back to unpacking the frustration. It's more than mispronunciation or bad translation. It's who gets to co-op these spices and how they do it that's deeply problematic. Rumia lays it down. Like the frustration for them is mostly the recognition that the foods and the things that they used to feel ashamed about, right? So the things that made them different at a younger age that somehow made them feel excluded from American, you know, white American culture are now being co-opted in certain ways that allows a person to signal not just their health and wellness attitude, but also their like ability to speak as a global citizen, whatever that might mean. I use that with all of the caveats. So I think the frustration for the students as I'm thinking back to it was really rooted in this idea that it's possible for white folks to discover things and to then capitalize on them in certain ways that feels alienating to have it used in a way that's unfamiliar, but then to also have it be an opportunity for a person who is participating in that sort of exchange economy to like somehow accumulate street cred or some sort of reputational advantage by accessing, in this case, turmeric. Okay, so while I'm obviously sensitized to why this is all pretty problematic, I still ask Rumia to help me do something that she might find a bit painful. But thankfully, she obliges. I ask her to spell it out. 
What really is the issue with buying $6 turmeric lattes or ghee in fancy bottles from Whole Foods for $35? I push this because while I know that there's general frustration at the sight of these commodified goods and sometimes brief follow-up discussions about how a South Asian context is being appropriated, it's not just that. Rumia weighs in to say that where someone is from may actually not even matter anymore. Like next level Orientalism. I think there's a flattening. I and mean, I don't know what exactly to do with this observation yet, but I don't know that it matters or is even visible or acknowledged that any of these things emerge from a specific geographical location. So for example, the idea, and turmeric is not specific to India or South Asia. It's specific to certain regions that are located in and around India and South Asia, but it's also, I mean, the idea that it comes from a certain place, that is a very facile understanding, but even that facile understanding is actually, I think, often missing. So in some cases, it feels like the use of these spices or the use of these ingredients, he is the most recent one, by the way, that I've noticed. I think... It's less about where it's from. It's a version of Orientalism now that doesn't even require geographical specificity. I don't think most people know that turmeric is associated with Indian cooking or South Asian cooking or Southeast Asian cooking or even, I mean, because I don't think it matters where it's from anymore. I think it just matters that it's loosely from the place, yeah, black and brown people come from, especially. So the place that turmeric is really from maybe doesn't really matter anymore to the first world wellness consumer. But I've also been wondering if there's any logic as to why certain South Asian ingredients get to become sexy. Like, why turmeric? Why ghee? Is it really just based on the women fancy of white tastes and concerns? Or is there something more to it? I asked Rumia if she can explain how and why certain South Asian ingredients become cool while we're basically asleep. So I'll put it this way. To the extent that there is a logic, I feel like it's still a pretty top-down phenomenon. So the places where people can easily buy such food tend to still be health food stores, right? Because these folks don't go to Indian grocers. I see white folks go to the Asian grocer to get certain things because it's cheaper, especially in a university town. And maybe this is an unfair statement because we only recently got a dedicated Indian grocer. But even otherwise, they don't want to go to where the Indian folks are shopping. So what I see more often is those trends are shaped by certain types of distribution and buyer practices. For example, I can tell you that over the past 15 years, you would never be able to find turdal at like a commercial grocer here very easily. Now it's commonly there. And now it's being positioned as the better dal, which I've started noticing people like saying that tur dal is like somehow a premier, more sophisticated or something than chana. Maybe I'm cynical, but I feel like that language is being curated. Like I feel like there, there are certain types of marketing strategies that are allowing for that positioning of certain goods and certain ingredients. Because these aren't things like the ready-made dal makhni that you can buy by Swad or whatever. These are raw ingredients. While what spice has become sexy is something that no one, maybe not even the white wellness consumer can predict, there is an important thread that runs through the foods that get to be called superfoods. It is no accident that they're usually foods from the global south. Where in the global south we are hearing may not matter. But still, I want to add my observation. The idea that the food should be from somewhere that's elsewhere, and an elsewhere that is somehow less and therefore exploitable, is crucial. And this is not just the case for Indian ingredients. Visits to Chinese restaurants in white suburban towns, for example, is another way in which otherness gets to be experienced on white terms. Rumia tells me more. So at least in the U.S., I can speak to the fact that immigration law made it possible for certain immigrant groups to run restaurants. When they were perhaps excluded from other types of industry, restaurants 
there's a very long and well-documented history of how that played out around Chinese exclusion and anti-Chinese sentiment and anti-Chinese immigration law in the late 19th and early 20th century. So what I think has happened in the U.S. at least is food spaces and commercial spaces like them are a way to experience otherness, but that maintains the white frame. It's very much on like white terms. And so when you start to think about it that way, you can understand why it has to be like microdosed. I love Rumia's image of microdosing on otherness, as disturbing as it is. I begin to think, is microdosing on wellness foods from exotic places a new way to travel? A way to travel without necessarily moving, if moving means inconveniencing yourself? I wonder further, does the ability to microdose on wellness foods from exotic places make physical travel kind of redundant? This may not be an answer, but it has me thinking about some of the discourse around photography in the late 19th century. This idea, especially in Britain, that you don't need to travel, the world can come to you. I wonder, right? These are all affective dimensions, photography, art, culture, through food. There has to be a link, especially considering where these consumptions are located, how elite they are seen as practices. You know, the idea that Indian food tends to still be a more expensive evening out is something I've never really been able to sort out because its position is not a cheap eat. There's like Dhaba styles that if you like actually went to, you know, where I grew up, if you actually like went to Hillcroft, you were going to be able to eat chat or what, you know, like you could get short eats and it was affordable. But to go to like an Indian restaurant, which was always mm-hmm. positioned in this Raja, like experience, like the music, all of it. And so that was, of course, curated for a particular consumer, a wealthy consumer. This imagination of not needing to move because the world is coming to you, which Rumya traces back to colonial British photography, and we are seeing now with the marketing of wellness foods, is fascinating to me. From my observations, this is sharpened for the new age yoga consumer who is able to cherry pick spiritual traditions and consume the foods that go along with them to enhance their wellness experience in the first world. I'm thinking about a wealthy white wellness consumer who can do Ashtanga yoga, drink coconut water, pick up their ghee from Whole Foods, and drive home in luxurious first world cars protected by lofty first world insurance. Participating in the Indian wellness practice offers them a kind of everyday holiday, a break from their lives when they want it. I see a desire, especially among a certain kind of clientele, to experience India as an escape. And, you know, it's a health escape, which is confusing if you think about it. It's kind of an oxymoron. (laughs) It's a healthy escape. But, like, to me, that signals that their everyday life is unhealthy. They need to go outside of white American practices to access this healthy lifestyle. And that looks like certain bodily practices of exercise, of course, but then it also means certain foods. The folks I've been able to observe tend to have really rigid ideas around what they will eat. There's a lot of like, my body is a temple sort of attitudes. They are primarily women, primarily upper middle class women. If they are not self-identified as white, they are proximate to whiteness in certain ways, aspiring whiteness in other ways. They absolutely go hand in hand. Partly because of the way these yoga studios are even set up. There's always a place where you can buy drinks, usually, especially if it's a studio that offers warmer settings. There will be coconut water. There'll be an opportunity to buy things that are meant to tie the yoga practice to eating and drinking things that are from India. And that has become more and more the case. Like I'm thinking about early on when I first started observing this trend, that wasn't always true. So I think that has been one of the things that has shifted in a particular direction to like tie ideologies of body and space. Right. It's, I think, to bring them into closer contact in some way. I think it's also important to problematize the singular blame 
that icons like Gwyneth Paltrow receive for cultural appropriation. I've been guilty of this too. Although it's tempting to allocate the blame somewhere and on someone powerful, the use of rich white women for wellness advertising has a long history. But I want to return for a minute back to the contemporary New Age supermarket that we've alluded to several times in this conversation. The Whole Foods, or if you're out of the United States, think of your neighborhood fancy organic store. The high-endedness of these types of shops often come from presenting food commodities to you in this world-is-your-oyster kind of grandeur. Dates from Israel, lemons from Italy, feta from Lebanon, spices from India, you get the drift. I talked to Vidya about this, who is currently based in Dubai, which arguably has some of the most globalized supermarkets in the world. What's the relationship between this display of diversity and the actual cultural makeup of the city, I ask her? It really is at the crossroads of so many cultures because people from so many different parts of the world come here in search of opportunities. You have people from various countries in Africa. You have people from various countries in Asia, such as the Philippines. You have a Chinese population. You have a large South Asian population. Plus you have, you know, people who migrate here from the West. At least in theory, Dubai is a very cosmopolitan city. But I suppose what makes it different is that not every one of these communities has public visibility. Or that, I mean, in the sense that it's it's not necessarily part of the global projection of what Dubai is. From my conversations that I've had with people, you know, they talk about the weather, they talk about the weather as in mostly these are people from the West who are like, oh my God, it's so sunny and warm. Or it's like, oh, I've heard that there are really fancy cars in Dubai. You know, so the global projection is one of aspiration, is one of being a kind of future global capital if it isn't already. And it's fiercely progressive. And I don't think there's space in that projection to necessarily represent accurately just how cosmopolitan it is by virtue of all the people who come here in search of jobs and opportunities. But when you go to the supermarket, and this is part of my journey of understanding the city and also my own place in it, the larger supermarkets have dedicated sections, you know, for Indian food, for Pakistani food, for Sri Lankan food, for Filipino food. I mean, these are the main demographics and they are kind of visibly represented, you know, in terms of aisles and all of that. But for me, the more interesting experience is always going to the smaller kind of grocery stores and the vegetable vendors that are actually a dying breed in Dubai, given the proliferation of supermarkets and their popularity. But these old school shops give you such a great sense of the people who come there to buy things. Rumia and I, too, imagine what it's like to be at a South Asian food aisle at a high-end supermarket in the U.S. In both our imaginations, it's the aisle that's teeming with wellness concoctions for the face, skin, and body. And often I've noticed that in these concoctions, only one exotic South Asian ingredient is allowed. One and no more. Otherwise, it gets too Indian or something. Too funky. There's this notion of distinctness that is produced, I think, because there's, you know, one ingredient. It's like the United Colors of Benetton or something of, like, food ingredients. So there's one from each area, but you're right. It's only one that can be associated with, say, India. I've personally also been fascinated by the aesthetics of otherness in the food shopping aisle. How indigenous cues are incorporated and then usually flattened by a minimal aesthetic that is often described as clean. In a piece titled Labels that I wrote for an Indian publication called 52, I argued that for hipster Indian brands in particular, Indian food needs to appear exotic to Indians themselves. And this is what allows them to command higher price tags. I have a field day talking to Ramya about this. I've often noticed the aesthetics of the act, like the design, so the font, for sure, but also like what sorts of animals they tend to use. So there's like a peacock, an elephant, tiger. Like there's very specific metonyms that it can appear. And it's kind of the way that like the rooster has become representative of Hawaii. And that's something I think that 
Disney made more prominent with one of their films. There's always like a non-speaking animal character, but that also is useful to locate the viewer, the white viewer in this, you know, sort of racial imagination, geographic racial imagination. And these kitschy minimal labels that advertise food from the global south are not just aesthetically appealing, they're also good for you. In other words, they're kind of everything. They're beautiful, pure, beneficial, and exotic. And most importantly, they're new and old at the same time. There's a temporal paradox that lies at the heart of the way in which Indian wellness ingredients are marketed. This idea of ancientness that goes on uninterrogated, I think for a lot of consumers, and I see this very much as a condition of like modern food production and consumption, there is this belief that if you eat food that has been eaten for a very long time by mm-hmm. people and people who have maintained their relationship with food cultivation in ways that you have not, that you will, you know, it's the fountain of youth narrative that tends to follow any type of Orientalist discourse. It feels like a return. There's some sort of return narrative that's built into how people think of this food as good for them. I asked Midya, as I did ask Rumia, to unpack her thoughts on the repackaging of everyday ingredients as cool food. I sort of expected the usual South Asian frustration, but was quite pleasantly surprised when she said it's more of a mixed feeling. And that's because, as Vidya points out, the conversation gets stalled at this kind of non-nuanced frustration. I find this idea of completely taking one thing and selling it as your own and profiting off of it, yes, I find that problematic. And that is basically cultural appropriation. Having said that, I think that what has not been decided or what we haven't yet been able to figure out or or the conversation hasn't advanced to the point where we can go beyond the outrage and the anger to think about how this accountability can be structured in a meaningful way. If we did want somebody who is selling turmeric milk lattes, you technically can't stop them. And I think that outraging about it is important, but it also serves a limited purpose. We naturally talk a bit about celebrity chefs that have recently been cancelled for cultural appropriation. The outrage builds, there's conversation about it. Somebody may be cancelled and then somebody else will come up and how that's an endless cycle, right? So I feel like we haven't gotten to the point where we can yet discuss how this conversation about giving due credit can actually be, how are we going to make this happen in the real sense? I think that's a conversation that needs to be had. All the stakeholders in this conversation need to sit together and, or at least in some virtual sense, have a conversation about, okay, you know, you are taking this from us and we can't stop you, but this is what we want, you know. Especially in food media, I think that accountability needs to have a concrete shape. And I don't think that we have progressed to that part of the conversation. So is there a way to globalize Indian food without appropriating it? Or is there a way to consume Indian food that's good for you without participating in a neo-colonial experience? I wondered if Vidya could point to any successful examples of this. There is no way to police the globalization of Indian food. I think there's a critical difference between encouraging it and policing it. I don't think that there's any way to police what somebody somewhere is going to make of Indian food. I don't even know whether that is necessarily such a good thing. But the thing, the example that came to my mind immediately is that, you know, people really like to hate on all these street food videos that come out of Gujarat, you know, typically like some horrendous sweet thing on top of some other sweet thing and save on top and you know like I've seen so many of these videos now and we laugh about it but we don't accuse them of anything except bad taste right like you're not gonna say oh you know these people took this idea from here and they kind of built on it and they are stealing from somebody else like you just grimace at what they have created which is certainly not to everyone's taste but you don't accuse them of 
stealing inspiration or whatever it is you know so i think that there's no way for us to stop what somebody somewhere is going to make of indian food and there are so many bad examples of this i mean you know there was that veligama which is a sri lankan restaurant in london she's actually a white woman who has some sri lankan roots i think she produced a cookbook which was widely panned because it appeared that she had plagiarized or at least used all the stereotypical tropes when she put together this cookbook and and a lot of people were really upset about the fact that the recipes did not seem genuine and just seemed like some sort of mishmash you know of things i was poorly researched and this seems like a recurring conversation that kind of seems to keep happening in these examples of plagiarism or misrepresentation it's pretty hard not to think about the question of authenticity. In critiques of cultural appropriation, we often encounter this narrative that makes it feel like sometimes that we should only be buying spices that are made by Indians in India or cookbooks that are written by Indians. But of course, this has its own problems. The question of authenticity is one that Vidya grapples with a lot, especially in her role as South Asian Whetstone editor. But when she thinks of authenticity as a constructed idea that is always under negotiation, she thinks more of cooking and especially South Indian women cooks who are often thought to embody the authentic. Like South Asian mothers who are all supposed to be great cooks and grandmothers, all reincarnations of the celebrity chef Darla Dalal, but too humble to actually want the fame. Vidya and I have a refreshing discussion about how our mothers and many of the women in our lives defied this model. These are all expectations that are very patriarchal one and two very prevalent as well you know in our part of the world and i think that these are complicated legacies and to represent them in as much complexity as possible like even in food writing you know i get lots and lots of pitches about my grandmother made me this my so and so made me that and as much as i see the worth and the value in the individual story and as much as i you know having been a writer for so many years also know that often that is a starting point for any conversation about food it defines the bedrock of your relationship to food i also feel like sometimes you know this idea that you must somehow hold on to what your grandmother gave you and represent it with the same level of proficiency i think that that is an unfair expectation and i think it adds to the already heavy weights that we carry you know as women are navigating a different world than our mothers and grandmothers for writers in north america and europe who are writing about foods from the global south the risk of cultural appropriation is always something to keep in mind whereas for writers from the global south this problem of having to embody authenticity not just in writing but also in cooking runs large so are there any solutions this is not a question that i usually ask but i wonder what would it look like to even begin decolonizing these practices rumia weighs in and as you may have guessed there's no easy answer usually the question right for a white audience comes from a place of moral turpitude like they don't want to be this person that they've just identified in my description the teacher in me will say well you didn't know this before probably reacting to it in the moment is not going to get you anywhere these like these were long processes by which all of this became what it is today a few years ago there was a piece run by a yoga journal that was a, written by this teacher this white man who went to mysore and it's just like a ridiculous article honestly he's like i was so worried about my child because it's so dirty there and i brought my white baby and my white wife and i mean the article is just absolutely insane i can't believe they ran it but it very much like it's a it was a yoga journal piece where it was speaking to a particular clientele who feel this way about going to india for teacher training or or whatever it is and i ended up working with a yoga teacher who's become a dear friend of mine sangeeta vallabhan and we wrote a response to it and where i'm going with this is that the editors were really stressed with our response <laughs> cuz they were like trying to make it palatable for the venue which is yoga journal which is a majority white 
yoga teacher clientele. So they kept pushing us. They wanted us to include questions at the end for reflection. I feel like that we fought a lot about them with the editors, but I think at the end, they kind of capture the essence of what I think is your question, which is when white people learn that they're white, what do they do next, especially in these sorts of settings? And that's where I'd like to leave off with no easy answers. Not quite a happy ending, I know, but it's not as easy as stop buying key from your fancy supermarket. It's more like, go ahead and do it, but let's try to cultivate an awareness that things like turmeric and ghee shaped food around the world long before they were hyper-commodified by industries like Hollywood. So let's celebrate their histories rather than only how they appear to us now in fancy Western markets. And in enjoying the fruits of their global distribution, let's be aware that sometimes our hyper-access to them can often come at the cost of denying the less powerful access to them. Sometimes these are the people who have enjoyed these foods for centuries. And yes, in the meantime, if you want to call out the people who say chai tea latte, I'm not going to stop you. Please join us for our upcoming and final episode of the season where I take you to the site of the farmers' protests in India. Thank you for joining me on Bad Table Manners. This episode is possible because of all the people who work behind the scenes. I'd like to thank my producer, Jennifer O'Neill, audio editor, Evan Lindsay, researchers, Julia Fine and Carolyn Crosby, and intern, Kai Stone. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder, Stephen Satterfield, Whetstone Radio Collective executive producer, Celine Glacier, sound engineer, Max Kodolchuk, associate producer, Quentin Lebeau, and sound intern, Simon Leibendar. You can subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can learn more about Bad Table Manners at whetstoneradio.com.